Hello everybody and welcome back. It's my pleasure today to share with you the second installment of the Registrar case series. Today, Dr. Lindsay Cash is going to take us through an approach to cirrhosis and portal hypertension. We're going to scroll through an actual CT scan of a patient with cirrhosis and she highlights the key features that we need to look for in patients with cirrhosis. After this, we're going to go through a handy checklist of some of the complications of cirrhosis and there's an excellent schematic where Dr. Cash highlights the mechanisms behind the various different signs that we see on a CT scan. This is an excellent talk. I hope you all enjoy it. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Cash. Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Cash and I'm a PGY2 resident at Integris Baptist in Oklahoma City in the United States. Today, I'm going to go over a case that we're going to see over and over again throughout our careers, so it's important to know the classic features as well as potential complications. So I have a CT of the abdomen with contrast in a 67-year-old male with history of alcohol use disorder. And I'm not going to go through my normal search pattern for today's exam just so that we don't waste our time looking at normal things, but I will point out all the pathology that we see. So I think the first thing to catch our eye is this very nodular contour of the liver. This is definitely a classic cirrhotic liver. It is a bit atrophic as well. And sometimes with cirrhosis, you can see distortion of the normal hepatic architecture. You can see hypertrophy of the caudate lobe in the left hepatic lobe, as well as atrophy of the right hepatic lobe. We're not really seeing that as much on this exam as you could in others, but once you see this classic cirrhotic liver, you know that in addition to your normal search pattern, you're gonna keep your eyes open for sequela of cirrhosis and portal hypertension. So first, we'll scan our liver for evidence of any abnormal areas of enhancement or hepatic masses. Any mass in the cirrhotic liver should be considered hepatocellular carcinoma until proven otherwise. So luckily, no hepatic masses in our liver, just a focal wedge-shaped hypodensity in the periphery of the right hepatic lobe. Don't worry, that's just a bit of focal fibrosis, not a mass. So next, let's take a look at our portal veins. And looking at our main portal vein here, it is looking a little bit thick. And it is, actually. It measures 16 millimeters in diameter. The upper limit of normal is 15 millimeters. So this is consistent with portal hypertension. While we're looking at our portal vein, let's make sure we don't have any evidence of thrombus in our portal veins. We can have bland thrombus or tumor thrombus. So especially if you see any mass in your liver, if you see any thrombus in your portal veins, check for any abnormal enhancement of that thrombus, that could be tumor thrombus. So while we're looking at vasculature, let's go over and look at some of these dilated contrast-filled tubular structures in the region of the lesser curvature of the stomach. So these are not normal here, right? We don't see these in a normal CT of the abdomen. And if we scroll up a little bit, we also see some dilated tubular structure adjacent to the esophagus. So I'm sure you guessed what these contrast-filled structures are. These are varices. And you may have also noticed this very abnormal dilated contrast filled structure in the region of the falciform ligament of the liver. And while this is definitely abnormal, there is actually some disagreement about what exactly this is. So in some radiologist reports, they will report that this is a recanulized umbilical vein, which in the adult is normally just seen barely as a collapsed structure called the ligamentum teres hepatis attached to the falciform ligament. The other argument is that this is a dilated para-umbilical vein and no recanalization is occurring. Either way, this is abnormal. So let's continue to follow this inferiorly towards the umbilicus. So we're following our dilated contrast-filled varix towards the umbilicus and we're actually going to follow it through the anterior abdominal wall into the subcutaneous tissues. And what does that make you think of? So this is what causes that classic appearance of the caput medusa with the dilated varices around the umbilicus. So as we're scrolling back up here, let's take a look at the spleen. And this spleen is definitely enlarged. Unlike the liver, which you measure at the midclavicular line, you can measure the spleen in any dimension. We want our spleen to be around 12 centimeters. Different people are different sizes and they have different size spleens. So we definitely don't want our spleen to be over 14 centimeters, and this one measured 14.5 centimeters, so it is definitely enlarged. 
So we're going to skip over our kidneys, our adrenal glands, our pancreas, and our stomach because, take my word for it, those were normal. We're going to scroll past our gallbladder here, which does have quite a few calcified and non-calcified gallstones in it without any pericholocystic fluid. So we're still scrolling down and keep your eyes on the region of colon just interior to the right kidney here. So as we scroll down, we're going to see that there is just a bit of inflammatory fat stranding around the region of the colon that is just a little bit too much for normal, just a bit more than what we would like. And also, as we scroll down, we see some thickening of that colonic wall, just mildly edematous and inflamed colon there. And also, while we're here, let's have a look at our overall peritoneum. Uh, we don't see any acidic fluid. That's definitely a common finding in cirrhosis that we're not seeing here. Sometimes ascites likes to hide above the liver or around the spleen. We actually don't see any here. So now that we've had a good look at the CT together, let's talk about these findings and how they all fit. Here we have a nice simple checklist of some things commonly seen in cirrhosis with portal hypertension and also a simplified diagram of the portal venous system from which the liver gets 70% of its blood supply, the other 30% being from the hepatic arteries. I have drawn in the large veins here, but just know they all have smaller tributaries. In general, the right and left gastric veins drain the stomach and lower esophagus. The splenic vein drains the spleen and some of the pancreas. The SNV, or superior mesenteric vein, drains quite a lot. It drains the cecum, ascending colon, majority of the transverse colon, the small intestine, part of the stomach and greater omentum, and part of the pancreas. The IMV, or inferior mesenteric veins, drain the upper rectum, sigmoid colon, descending colon, and splenic flexure. Portal hypertension occurs when the pressure gradient in the portal venous system is elevated. This can be assessed indirectly by measuring the hepatic venous pressure gradient, or HVPG. There is some debate about what is clinically significant portal hypertension, but in general, an HVPG greater than 5 is elevated, and as portal hypertension, clinically significant portal hypertension is greater than 10. So what causes this? We can group our causes of portal hypertension into three main causes, prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic. Prehepatic causes of portal hypertension include any pathology that occurs before we get to the liver when we're thinking of portal venous blood flow. This can be portal venous thrombus, splenic vein thrombus, or extrinsic compression of the portal veins, among other things. Intrahepatic causes of portal hypertension are by far the most common, and of these, cirrhosis is the most common. Other potential causes are anything that severely damages the liver parenchyma, such as hepatitis, autoimmune or acquired, or polycystic liver disease. Over time, the liver parenchyma becomes severely fibrotic, which causes a large amount of resistance to blood flow through the liver. Last are post-hepatic causes of portal hypertension and include anything that affects the flow of blood after it leaves the liver. This can include hepatic venous obstruction, aka Bud-Chiari syndrome, right-sided heart failure, or constrictive pericarditis all of which cause a large amount of resistance in the hepatic veins, which in turn causes resistance in the portal veins. Getting back to our CT findings, in clinically significant portal hypertension, portosystemic collateral pathways or varices develop. These are dilations of pre-existing anastomotic connections between the portal and systemic systems. This is a compensatory mechanism for blood to bypass the liver and flow back into the systemic circulation. We saw quite a few varices on our CT in the region of the esophagus, the stomach, and the umbilical or paraumbilical veins. I don't have a CT of the pelvis, but varices in the region of the rectum and anal canal, or more commonly known as hemorrhoids, are also commonly due to portosystemic anastomoses in this location. There are also definitely more locations of varices in the abdomen, such as perisplenic and mesenteric varices. One thing that I didn't mention while looking at the prior CT is that, as we know, varices can bleed, so keep your eyes open for any hyperdense material in the bowel lumen or in the peritoneal cavity. Splenic enlargement is also common. 
As the pressure increases in the portal vein, it also increases in the splenic vein, which causes the spleen to become congested and enlarged as it becomes more difficult for blood to flow through the spleen. We can't see this on CT, but hypersplenism also commonly occurs in parallel with splenic enlargement, where the spleen starts to destroy too many platelets and blood cells, leading to various cytopenias. Bowel wall thickening and edema is also commonly seen in portal hypertension and is collectively termed portal gastroenterocolopathy. This occurs due to dilatation and increased permeability of the submucosal veins as the pressure gradients in the superior mesenteric vein and inferior mesenteric vein increase. This is important to know so that you don't inadvertently suggest that a patient has acute enteritis or colitis when that might not be the case. Now, our patient did not have ascites, but this is another common manifestation of portal hypertension on CT, which appears as hypodense fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Without going into too much depth in portal hypertension, elevated portal venous pressure causes a hydrostatic pressure imbalance and release of inflammatory mediators such as nitrous oxide. This causes arterial dilatation and activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, thus causing the body to hold on to more sodium, which then causes the body to hold on to more water. And last, I want to mention hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, This one is not directly a result of portal hypertension, but since cirrhosis is the leading cause of HCC, I want to mention it here so you always keep it in mind when doing your search pattern in a patient with cirrhosis, regardless of the etiology. The classic appearance of HCC is avid arterial phase enhancement with washout in a pseudocapsule on delayed imaging. However, remember that nothing wants to live in a cirrhotic liver, so even if you don't have the typical findings of HCC, think twice before assigning a benign etiology to any suspicious liver lesion. Well, that is all I have for you today. Um, Thank you so much, Michael, for having me on your channel, and I want to thank you all for your attention, and I hope this has been valuable for you. Thank you, Dr. Cash, for an excellent presentation. For me, it's a great reminder that when you see features of cirrhosis, you need to go looking for some of the potential complications. Splitting those complications into portal hypertension and the complications associated with that, varices that can bleed, splenomegaly with hypersplenism, gastroenterocolopathy, ascites, looking for all of these features on our CT scan, and then remembering that patients with cirrhosis have a higher chance of having hepatocellular carcinoma. And not only is that likelihood higher, it's often more difficult to identify an HEC in a cirrhotic liver. And teasing out whether a mass is a metastasis, whether it's an HCC, or whether it's a regenerative nodule that you see in cirrhosis can be difficult, especially because, as you say, nothing likes to grow within a cirrhotic liver. Please thank Dr. Cash in the comments below for the time that she spent on creating such an excellent presentation. And a reminder, if you want to do a registrar case presentation on this channel, you can contact me. I've left my email in the description below. We can get a video going that hopefully we can place on this channel. Next week, we've got another great talk coming up and I can't wait to share that one with you too. So until next time, goodbye everybody.